Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome to the show today. I have with me in the studio my father, Dr. Thane Urey, author, teacher, and Christian apologist who has made the central focus of his life in ministry helping people understand and rightly interpret the book of Genesis. Um, having been a college and seminary uh, theology and evangelism professor, he has spoken on topics related to the relationship between science and the Bible, the ultimate reliability and authority of the scriptures, and what Moses wanted us to understand about the creation narrative. And I just want to say welcome, Thane. It's so good to have you on the show with us today. Good to be back. Thank you. The key question that we want to open up with today is, um, how do we know when to take the Scripture literally? <laughs> well, you know really how to open up with a huge, a huge question there, Cameron. That's way too huge for us for just a little 15-minute segment. Hmm. Whole books have been written on this, whole decades of, of, of yes, debate. Yes, they have. Even back in the early uh, centuries, the early uh, opening chapters of the birth of the church, you had church councils where they kind of debated these things, these things vigorously back and forth for decades and it took the church even hundreds of years to uh, even figure out certain things and kind of clarify what the Scripture was uh, teaching. Let me just start out by quoting Richard Averbeck, who said recently, no matter what you say on Genesis, you're going to make a lot of people really upset. No matter where you come down on issues of interpretation, hermeneutics, theology, you're going to make some people upset. So we're not worried about that today. We're trying to say we're worried about being faithful to Scripture. And we're coming about uh, this from, from several different angles. But first we want to say that we're just kind of having an open dialogue here, a back and forth session to talk about these things. We're not saying this is a line of the sand or we're speaking inerrantly or ex cathedra. We're just saying to the church at large to be challenged to go back to the word as close as possible. What did the original author of scripture most likely mean when he was writing these things? What did he want his audience to pick up and understand? So when people say, do you take the scripture literally? You almost expect some kind of Phantom of the Opera kind of background music. To, oh, whoa, you don't take it literally, do you? Well, we don't take it literally in that kind of a, a pedantic sense, like we believe when Jesus said, I am the door, that somehow he had a, a little doorknob on his hip or something. We know there's figures of speech given. I am the vine, you, you, know, you are the branches. We understand there's symbolism here. But what we mean by literalism is not wooden-headed literalism. But what we mean by that is, what did the author originally mean for his audience to understand? Mm -hmm. If we grasp that, yes. that's what we typically mean by taking the Scripture literally. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we have to be in the Word, and we have, to, we have to take the time to enter into the world of the author to understand the figures of speech and that kind of thing. Exactly. And that doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it takes years, sometimes decades. And so I love people like Dennis Kendall and others that we've kind of revered over the years, that they sometimes will be studying the Scripture for 20, 30, 40 years and see a brand new nuance they missed 40 years earlier, because that's what it means to live with the Word and to be pleading with the Spirit over the decades. Jesus, help me. Help me to understand clearer your Word. Absolutely. So expound for us a little bit what it means to take the Bible literally. Okay. Well, you mean from Genesis, for example? Yes. Well, sometimes when we come to that, people will sometimes look into the text and say, you, you can't take that literally, right? You don't believe in a literal six-day creation or a literal worldwide flood, do you? You don't believe in a talking snake, do you? You don't believe that Adam and Eve were real people, do you? Well, these are huge questions, and I'm not saying we can answer those today, but we're trying to say is using the, the, the rules of, of grammar and using the ways that people would understand uh, the plain meaning of the text, that's where we're kind of approaching the text with this mindset of saying we're willing to let the Scripture speak for itself. Now, when you say that, people will respond, theologians, you can't be that simplistic. There's so much more going on. And we say we understand that, that the Reformers – we're saying that they believe the Spirit could have inspired the text so clearly that it was meant to be understood. And yes, we understand that Second Peter uh, three fifteen, we'll say three sixteen rather, will say that there are some things in Scripture that are hard to understand. But of course, it doesn't say there are some things that are impossible to understand. It just means that there are some things in Scripture, not all things, but some things that take a lot of time to understand, like the Trinity and things like that. So a good question for us would be, like, what does it mean to rightly divide the word? Mm -hmm. 
of truth. How do we learn to rightly divide the word of truth? Mm -hmm. Let's take just two texts in our mind. Let's take 2 Timothy 2.15, and let's take 2 Peter 3.16. One verse talks about rightly dividing the word of truth, the command there, an imperative given from Paul. And Paul there is saying the word sometimes I think that King James has to cut straight, literally, to cut something. Uh, the, the Greek root there is T-O-M, tom. And so if you have an atom, like our atom, something that supposedly was unsplittable, it means it's uncuttable. So anytime you wor- find the word tom in uh, some Greek word, most usually it has something to do with cutting. So ortho tomeo is the verb there. Ortho, anybody who's been to an orthodontist like I have for many, many years back to straighten your teeth or an orthopedic surgeon to straighten something, that word means ortho tomeo literally means to cut straight. So Paul is saying there to rightly divide the word. He's not saying like with the Thomas Jefferson Bible that you take your pen knife and you, you cut out whatever you don't like. He's not saying anything like that. It's a, a figure of speech meaning to handle something accurately. So an orthotomeo mason back in his day would chip, 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 would cut stones just right, just precisely for the foundation of a building so it would have a firm foundation. You did not want to go into an or, uh, a building or structure that was not built by an orthotomeo uh, conditioned mason. You wanted someone to cut the stones correct. The word is mm-hmm. also used in those days, the, someone like a guide who would cut a straight path to get you safely to your destination, or even used of a Levitical priest in the Septuagint to talk about rightly cutting the sacrificial animals. The common denominator there, whether cutting a straight path, uh, making a firm foundation for a building, or preparing the sacrificial animals just precisely, the common denominator is you did all of these things with extreme precision. Mm -hmm. So Paul, in those days, those people understood the word, what that word meant, you didn't handle the word just, what do you think? Like Walter Kaiser uh, playfully says, we have this pooled ignorance sessions across evangelicalism today. What do you think? Well, what do you think? Well, what do you think? No, what do you think? It's not how we think or how what we feel. We are trying to actually get at the text for what it meant. Not always easy, but unless the Holy Spirit is the author of confusion, he wrote these words, inspired these words, so they could be understood. Mm-hmm. The opposite of that is found in Second Timothy, uh, Second Peter, rather, 316. And I don't have the text in front of me, but there uh, Peter is saying there are some people that twist Paul's writings as they do the rest of Scripture to their own destruction. So we have one template on one side to rightly divide the word, and on the opposite side of the spectrum, there are those who don't divide the word straightly. Mm-hmm. And that word there is very interesting. The word there in the Greek is streblao. A streblas person, a streblas man would be a twisted Person. So if the audience is going to envision having a piece of paper or maybe a, an empty Pepsi plastic bottle in front of them, if they twisted that bottle, twisted it, twisted it, twisted it, twisted it, and held it up, they would have a contorted image of a Pepsi bottle. Something that's twisted and contorted uh, in, in that way, and it would not be something mm-hmm. pleasant to see. So just these, these word pictures I'm trying to think, think about for rightly dividing the word. The Spirit yeah. is saying, I want you to handle my word with extreme precision. Try and get at it to what I originally meant the original audience mm-hmm. to understand and what it, how it may apply even today, and to shy away from the approach that Peter talks about, those who twist God's word. And it's not without consequence, because there in Peter he says, those who twist God's word, or Paul's writings as they do the rest of Scripture, to their own destruction. There is a cause mm-hmm. to mishandling mm-hmm. God's word. Yes. And I think there are some people who say that um, the Word of God can pretty much mean whatever you want it to mean, you know, that it's it, what it says is relative, but it really isn't. When we get into the text, when we explore, like you said, the background and and uh, the figures of speech, and we rightly divide, if we take the time to do that, um, placing those passages that are difficult in the context in which they were originally given, Scripture does have something specific to say. You're right. And, and it even, can't be taken any way. I remember, they want it. I remember Douglas Kelly in his book, Creation and Change, where he says this, there are many things in the Bible that are hard to understand. Genesis is not one of them. Hmm. Wow. That's powerful. That's powerful. Um, I sometimes hear um, that Augustine was flexible um, in his interpretation of the seven days of creation. 
Um, do you find that to be true? I find that very common. He's quite, I'll quote it all over the place. He's a tremendous church father, tremendous thinker. A, I would even say a genius in many regards. Everybody wants to have a piece of Augustine in the sense they want to be able to invoke his authority, even ourselves here. But you have Biologos and you have the Faraday Institute, all kinds of people, all manner, whether it's uh, reasons to believe, uh, all people, all people that are Christians want to invoke his authority. We can't really distill in, in just two minutes here all of his thought, but I would say this. They would come back and say he was unclear on the word yom, for example, in Genesis, mm-hmm. and saying the word for day. And he would say, even himself, he was saying these are special days. They really are very hard to understand. And he didn't take them literally. And you know what? I would come back and say that's true. He did not take them literally. But here's what really is going on there. You can't say he took them non-literally, therefore he was open to millions of years. He was not open to that in any way, shape, or form. He believed all of creation was instantaneous, that God did all of his work in one day, and then the rest of the time was an unfolding of, of, of telling us what happened, that all creation was in a single instant. So if you're going to take Augustine's authority and invoke his authority, how far are you going to go with that? He would even say, and I have a quote here where he says, uh, these Egyptian astronomers have deceived us too, with their mendacious documents. But he says here, reckoning by the sacred writings, exact quote here, reckoning by the sacred writings, in other words, the Christian scriptures, we find that not yet 6,000 years have passed. So oftentimes, this Augustine, who I love and revere, he's an incredible mind, I want to uh, command his authority as, as whenever I can, but he's just a man. He did not know Hebrew, for example. He knew Greek, he learned Greek later in his life, he did not know Hebrew. He, therefore, when you come to his exegesis of Hebrew in his book, his two-volume set on the literal interpretation of Genesis, he didn't know Hebrew. So how can we trust him when it comes to a word-for-word deep analysis of the Hebrew text, right? Mm-hmm. And on things like uh, the fall, he believed in a literal fall of Adam and Eve. He believed in a literal garden. He believed in a literal worldwide catastrophic flood. So I'm not saying he's right or wrong. I'm just merely saying is when people want to invoke Augustine, they sometimes do that to try and fuzzify matters. Say he himself didn't believe in a literal Genesis. Well, you know what? No, yes, he did. He kind of held to a position like I'm looking at you right now, and he held a position very, very close, if not exactly to what you yourself hold, Cameron, because he held himself to the absolute authority of God's word. And he may have allowed for some difference in interpretation on some nuances in Genesis, but not the entire corpus. Mm. He believed the word hook, line, and sinker. Well, we want to thank you so much for being with us on the show today. Tune in next week as we continue our study. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word, and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.